Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this special edition of Bang the Book Radio. It is Wednesday, June 5th, and we're chatting the Belmont Stakes with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and <clears throat> Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam. How you doing, buddy? In the summer months, uh, the triple crown races are kind of a nice diversion for us, and before you know it, uh, training camps will open. Yep, absolutely. We're starting to talk football over at bangthebook.com. We're starting to unroll our NFL season win total previews. AFC East and AFC North posted over at the website right now. And Brian also on our Bang the Book YouTube page putting together his thoughts here for four of the divisions so far uh, for the upcoming NFL season. So some good videos for you to check out over on our Bang the Book YouTube page. As you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB, the number 200, is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sports book. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. And uh, a lot of bets going to be thrown out here this weekend for the Belmont Stakes, Brian. And before we get specifically into the handicap of this race, after this weekend, a lot of people forget about horse racing until probably the Breeders' Cup, you know, in uh, in late October, early November range. So, what tips would you have for people that, you know, maybe going to the track here over the summer, looking to enjoy the nice weather, something like that. So again, horse racing kind of falls out of the spotlight now for a while, but there's still racing and events going on every weekend at tracks around the country. Yeah. Well, the irony to be honest with you is um, I hear what you're saying. I'm not saying the novice, but let's say the casual horse racing fan, many it doesn't get near the publicity that it gets with triple crown races. But to me, this is the most entertaining time of the year because very soon, you know, we'll have the summer races, the Travers, the Haskell, and then there are big races that lead up to the big show, the Breeders' Cup in the fall. And obviously this year, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, with Santa Anita and the problems they've had. But you know, when Saratoga opens, um, I- I'm telling you, Adam, you're starting because any day the Derby winner next year could be making his debut appearance. The babies start to roll out. The the two-year-olds come out. And honestly, I love the maiden races. I mean, when you really say, hey, where's a chance to make a score, be it breeding, trainers that are adept at getting them ready to fire a shot out of the gate, uh, you can find – and then the the one thing I will say I do – uh, at Equibase.com, it's called the Virtual Stable, and basically you just sign up and you and you get a you build your own stable, and literally you watch a, a baby race, and a horse stumbles at the start or gets checked or cut off or blows the brake and comes flying late, and, and all of a sudden, to me, the best thing about horse racing, the past performance you and I were talking before we started, you know, there's a lot you know, that you got to go through when you're dissecting the form and all the information that's there. But don't ever sell short what you see, and that's the eyeball test. And if you see a horse that had a trouble trip, you want to you want to get alerted when that horse is going to run back because what you saw says to you that that, was a, that horse could have won the race but something happened. So you get that alert the next time the horse is running, but you can still get some big price plays at this time of the year. Yeah, and of course, you know, for some of these events, like I know the Ohio Derby is coming up, I believe, two weeks from Saturday. I think it's June 22nd at Thistledown. Long Range Toddy expected to be the favorite, one of the horses that ran in the Kentucky Derby. But, you know, with a lot of these events, these different events across the country, you're going to see jockey names that you recognize. You're going to see a lot of trainer names that you recognize. There's a lot of good opportunities here over the summer months to make some scratch betting horses, to be sure. So, A lot of these names that we've been talking about for these Triple Crown races uh, or the Philly races that I've been writing about over at bangthebook.com, keep an eye out for those trainers and jockeys because they're going to help you here over the summer months as well. No, and honestly, and I would say to you, at like a a place like Thistle Downs, uh, some of the smaller circuits, those are big days. I mean, those are those are the day, and there are trainers that point horses, and they're like Churchill and Oakland. Uh, the undercards are where the money is in many instances. And it's a big thing for a small track if a John Velasquez or a Mike Smith shows up. 
All right, so as we take a look here at the Belmont, where we've got guys like John Velasquez, guys like Mike Smith in this race here, War of Will, 2-1, to one, Tacitus, 9-5. to five. Both of them draw the outside here, posts 9 and 10. And, you know, look, I mean, we're going to talk about all the horses in this field and try to come up with some things from an, ex- from an exotic standpoint, you know, for the tries and the supers. But, you know, as you mentioned in your video over on our Bang the Book YouTube page, as a lot of people seem to be saying, this looks like a chalky race. It does, and but there, there are caveats to it. I mean, it's a mile and a half, and it's you know, we always say the distance is a concern at the the Derby. It's a mile and a quarter. This is a mile and a half, and it, and it's about can the horse get the distance? But honestly, the, the jockeys matter, and if there was a, a chink in the armor for War of Will, and this may be unfair to Tyler Gap Leon. Uh, it's knowing Belmont. I mean, I always go back and I don't know to this day, I don't know uh, if it's fair or unfair, but Smarty Jones missed the triple crown by a lip. And Stuart Elliott, a Philly based writer, uh, he moved too early. And the, the thing with this race, and the pace is generally slower because it's such a far race. And the closers are generally closer to the pace than they are at shorter distances. So it's a quirky kind of race. But the jockey really has to have patience. I mean, you got to, Jerry Bailey, I think, described, you got to wait, you got to wait. And when you think it's time to go, you have to wait and then wait and then wait some more. And, you know, that Smarty Jones thing, there are those that say Smarty Jones. Made the made his winning move way too early, and just you know ran out of gas at the wire. So the lack of experience, per se, uh, you know, would be the the shortcoming for War of Will with Gaff Leone in the irons. That it, it, you know he's a great rider, and this horse has done nothing wrong. I still think he's the horse, but that that would be, you know, well, one of the at least on paper question marks for me. Well, and as you look at War of Will here, the only horse to run in all three of the Triple Crown races. So what do you make of that? With this relatively quick turnaround here, three races in, you know, essentially five weeks, what do you think about that for War of Will? Well, Mark Cassie's a terrific trainer. I mean, many, many years in Canada, and he's got, he's all over North America with horses, and his horses run on broken glass. But uh, you know, I, I guess the case would be made. I mean, a the purse isn't nothing to sneeze at, and it's a triple crown race, and it all adds up to money down the road in the breeding shed. But you know, from a legacy perspective, I thought when War of Will got hit by Maximum Security, he he got bumped, and the other horses got the worst of it. Uh, but then War of Will was clear, and he was like a length and a half, two lengths behind maximum security, and he flattened out. Well, I don't know. I think that, well, I guess I was wrong. If it's proven he's, I was wrong because he won the Preakness. But the rail was so good at the Preakness that even now there are question marks where he got the garden trip in the Preakness. But legacy-wise, War of Will, if he were to win the Belmont, they'll sit there and say he could have been a triple crown champion. He won the Preakness, he won the Belmont, and he was the horse that was interfered with by maximum security. So, you know, Cassie wouldn't send the horse out if the horse wasn't doing right. Um, But, you know, legacy-wise, right, I mean, I guess they'd have a legitimate excuse, say, hey, he was the horse that got wiped out in the Derby initially. So as we look at the 10 posts here, just on the outside of War of Will, we look at Tacitus, who wound up hitting the board at the Kentucky Derby, was fourth before the DQ, wound up being third after maximum security was taken down off the board. Something interesting here that you mentioned in your video, I guess is a great point to make here, about Tacitus's father and what impact that could have on the race. Um, Tacitus is sired by Tappet, Tappet Runners. Tappet Offsprings have won three of the last five Belmonts. So breeding in this particular instance, uh, getting this distance certainly means a lot. So that is, that is certainly the feather in Tacitus's cap. And honestly, I have, 
I guess I don't have a beef with it. I, mean, I did with Maximum Security. If you remember the video we did for the Derby, I thought Maximum Security's morning line at 10 to 1 was was just fool's gold. And then Omaha Beach scratched. Well, I, I like Matt. I didn't care about Omaha Beach. I, th- I thought Maximum Security would have got bet down to 5 to 1, 9 to 2, regardless of if Omaha Beach was in. But when Omaha Beach was in, Maximum Security really plummeted. Uh, but I, you know, they make this one the favorite. And I, I if, if there was a determining factor, I, I would think maybe ta- the Tappet influence maybe could be that difference. Yeah, test us here at 9 to 5, the morning line favorite. We'll obviously see what happens here as we approach race day. War of Will will get a lot of love, could wind up closing the favorite here for this race. But there are actually three offsprings from Tappet here in this race. Bourbon War and Intrepid Heart, the other two. Let's talk about Intrepid Heart for a minute here because Son of Tappet and the Pletcher Velasquez combo, how is this horse sitting there at 10 to 1 right now? Um, you know, I, he's lightly raced. Uh, because, well, he, he's finished third in a, in a grade three, and it was a field of five in the grade three. Other than that, he won a maiden race and a claiming race. Um, the connections are amazing. The breeding is terrific. And in the Peter Pan, he stumbled at the start of the race, which can be kind of disconcerting. Um, but he would have to really up the ante here, I think, uh, to compete with the others. You know, can he run a competitive race yet? Can he win it? Sure. Um, I, I just don't see the foundation that's there to get the job done here. I mean, you can say being fresh is an asset. Uh, I, I, it looks to me like he's a cut below the others. Pletcher has two horses here in this race. The other one is Spinoff, who we saw in the Kentucky Derby. Never really a factor. Finished 18th. Javier Castellano in the Irons here. Now, these two Pletcher horses. I mean, anytime you get a Pletcher horse in a spotlight race, people are going to flock to it. So we kind of threw a little bit of cold water on Intrepid Heart there. Do you see Spinoff being a line mover on Saturday? The funny thing is, I, and I think you'll get, you'll get a price here. And I would look at spinoff as being a, a much better option for Pletcher here. He comes out of the Derby, ran uh, 18th. I mean, you know, just it broke from the fire outside. Didn't handle the sloppy track at all. And just did, never fired a shot. But raced a really good race in the Louisiana Derby uh, with a figure that it was terrific. Now, if you're if you're willing, and that's how you make money in this game, Adam. I mean, you have to be willing to draw a line through the last race. Now, it's coming out. Of, he's coming out of the Derby. Uh, you know, he's fifty-two to one in the Derby. But the last time on a main track, ran a buyer figure that would certainly have him in the hunt here. And you know, it's been freshened up for this. And the workouts, by the way, are off the charts. His last work on May 25th says this horse is sitting on a shot. Actually, I, I kind of, you know, look at spinoff here as, you know, a pretty, pretty interesting option. So are, are you thinking Cast- Cast- as an option? Castellano's no ham sandwich. Either. I mean, as an option you know, to win or just something you would throw in your exotics? Well, Again, going back to are you willing to draw a line through the last race, uh, he, he he wins at Tampa Bay. Then he runs second in the Louisiana Derby. And all these trainers who are adept at this, and Todd Fletcher's certainly adept at this, it's all about peaking on the first Saturday in May. And obviously the, the track came up a soup kitchen. And if the horse just flat out didn't like it, if you completely draw a line through the Kentucky Derby and just go the race prior to that and the workouts that are coming in here, it's not outlandish to say a horse like Spinoff could contend. Well, and that's something that's really interesting, too, here, because Spinoff drew a far outside post. I believe started, what, 18th or 19th there in the Kentucky Derby. And again, there were 20 horses in that race. Well, 19 horses in that race. 
These horses do not run with 19 other horses at any other point in their careers. There are 10 horses in this race. It's a post inside the middle position with the six draw there. So this is just a completely different race, I think. I mean, yeah, everyone wants to look at the Kentucky Derby, see how you stacked up against the best of the best. You're not running from 19th here. You're not running from that auxiliary gate. You're not running from the outside with 19 horses out there in the field. And also, the weather is going to be nice on Saturday. It's supposed to be beautiful in New York for this race. It was terrible in Kentucky, as you mentioned, at Churchill. I agree with you. I think this is one that you do want to have on your radar here. Well, again, with every horse race, you're trying to be Kreskin, right? You're, you're trying to read the Rubik's Cube, and you're trying to read the trainer's mind. The trainer is so important when it comes to these events. Now, let's just compare the Pletcher horses. Intrepid Heart, uh, a maiden win uh, in February. Really nice win. And they didn't rush the horse into the fray. So we ran in a, in a claiming horse. Pletcher basically said the horse was, it was over his head to get into the triple crown chase. So he raced in a claiming race at Keeneland. Oh, wins the race, and then they put him in the Peter Pan, which is basically, it's a grade three, but it's a prep for the Belmont. It's horses that are pointed for the Belmont race in the Peter Pan. So way back when, Pletcher was targeting the Belmont with Intrepid Heart because the horse just wasn't up to snuff with the other horses at that time. Spinoff was one, he was pointing for the first Saturday in May, and all of a sudden the weather, the track, the field, you know, what, for whatever reason, this horse did not fire his shot. So immediately then, Fletcher says, I've got five weeks and makes his focus of attention. Forget the preakness. I am targeting the Belmont. So he had five weeks to work with a horse that he thought it up of in the Kentucky Derby to point to the Belmont. I like him a lot better uh, than Intrepid Hart. I like it. I think it's a good breakdown there. And, and one of the angles that we already talked about, you know, the offspring of Tappet, one other horse here coming from Tappet, that's Bourbon War, Mike Smith, up in the irons for this one here. Obviously, anytime Mike Smith's in a triple crown race now, you kind of take notice of that. How about Bourbon War, who's drawn from the five post here? Well, the thing that's disconcerting, but again, it comes down to the willing to draw a line through a race. But Bourbon War was kind of the buzz horse for the Preakness, and he didn't fire at all. And Bourbon War, because you always try to find those common frames of references, who'd you run against, where'd you come from? Well, the Florida Derby ended up being kind of the key race going into the Kentucky Derby. So people made the excuse of the the track, the this, the that, and fought Bourbon War would then be a major player if he ran his race in the Preakness, and he didn't. So there are chinks in the armor, but the same premise holds true. He raced against maximum security and came out of the Florida Derby, and, you know, this is a horse that, that, that if, if he runs his race, is certainly capable of contending. It just seems like he's trending the other way. But then again, you know, the trainer finds, you know, a legitimate excuse somewhere along the way and thinks he figured something out. I mean, but hey, the biggest, the the biggest uh, example of that is uh, Everfast. I mean, if you remember, we did our our video uh, for the Preakness, and I remember saying it, but I didn't take my own advice. Say, I don't know what's what's with this Everfast. That, that, on paper, you look, and that horse had ten races coming into the Preakness, and had only won once and really never ran any – I mean, he ran in grade ones and grade twos, but he just never ran any good figure or anything. And then Dale Romans throws him in the Preakness. And I'm like, why is this horse in here? On paper, Everfast looked like he couldn't have won the fifth race on the undercard. But you know the trainer, Dale Romans, you're going, he must – he's putting this horse in there for a reason. I remember being leery about it in the video we did. And sure enough, the horse come from the clouds and got second. The problem with Everfast is he come up the rail, and the rail was a garden spot that day. So good for Rosario. It was a great ride. 
took advantage, 29 to 1, and ran second. But he ran a 96 buyer in that race, by far and away his best figure. And the races prior to that, he had a 74, 79, and a 65. The, the, there's a theory, some are into it, some are not. I think most people are. Uh, it's called a bounce. When a horse out of nowhere runs a career best, the next race they regress mightily. This horse is the definition of a bounce. But Everfat, serious, it's almost like there was, that's why I said that in the videos. There must have been something that Romans knew, that he had a breathing problem, and that they figured, so they found something, said, oh, this poor horse, he had a breathing problem, or he did this, or, or they, they, they changed a piece of equipment. But there was something that told Dale Romans, this horse deserve, was deserving to be there, and no one thought he was. You know, I mean, but again, that's going to to the point of trying to read between the lines and and how much belief do you have in the trainer? Well, and obviously trainer and jockey are both motivated here for the race this weekend. But Luis Saez, he's obviously got a lot on his mind here looking for a little bit of retribution this week at the Belmont. We'll see if he gets it on ever fast. But as you mentioned, I think that you're definitely on track there uh, with a pretty big regression for that horse. The third favorite on the board. We haven't even talked about this horse yet. It's the third favorite on the board, but it's eight to one on the morning line. It's Master Fencer. Julian Leperu going to be up atop there, drawing from the three post. I don't know what to think about this horse. And I think that's kind of a thing with a lot of the horses here in this race, but especially this one, because we don't have a lot of data for this horse. Well, I, I will tell you that I, I and it, it did not work out, but I had been on win, win, win in the Derby and the Preakness. And I thought, you know, that was a horse that just always ran on, and I, that horse fits the profile for the Belmont. And there's always that horse in the Kentucky Derby where you watch the race and go, that's the horse for the Belmont. I can't tell you, the, the one that, that immediately comes to mind is a horse named Jazzle that I had in the Kentucky Derby, and he, he didn't get it done. But I said, I, there, there wasn't a doubt in my mind when they were galloping out in the Derby, Jazzle would win the Belmont, and Jazzle won the Belmont. Uh, it's just there's that running style with the extra distance, and the horse, obviously, it, it's almost to give that air of they get stronger as they're running farther, and Master Fencer, I was all in. The only thing that makes me leery, he says he got, you know, he took a bad step during a workout. Well, his workouts are nothing. I mean, they're, they're garbage. They were garbage going into the derby. Uh, if the horse is right, the way this horse closed in the derby finished seven, but by four lengths. And, you know, at one point was 23 lengths out of it. Well, that was at a mile and a quarter. Now you're stretching out another quarter of a mile. That sustained run would have put Master Fencer right in the discussion here. And then the other thing we alluded to earlier, because this race is longer, they generally don't go as fast up front, so the closers are much closer to the pace. Generally speaking, they're, they're not 23 lanes out of it. and gonna, They're going to, because they're going to go 40, 50, let's say 49, 50, for the half mile, instead of in the Derby when they went 46 and three, Master Fencer should be. I would think, even if they they set them dead last, dead last in this race to me means maybe 10, 11 lengths out of it, and yeah, he's he's really intriguing, man. And here's the other thing, Adam, did he fire that shot because he enjoyed the sloppy track, and you know might a fast main track be a detriment to this horse? He is as big a wild card as you alluded to, but based on the way he closed in the Derby, I I think you you got to take a peek here. I really do. I, he would be the one to me that is the if there. I, you know, we kind of talked ourselves into spinoff a little bit, being being an interesting one. But if if somebody was was going to knock off the top two, I think it's Master Fencer. 
I, I think so. I mean, it's it's one of those things, too, where, you know, Leperu is up there again, as he was in the Kentucky Derby. Maybe he just has his finger on the pulse of this horse. Maybe he knows, as you just mentioned, when to make that shot, because that may be the most important thing. I think from a jockey standpoint, you know, obviously there are different challenges to every race. For the Derby, it's navigating the huge field. For the Preakness, it's being able to set the pace and stay out in front of it. For the Belmont, it's knowing when to push the gas pedal down. Maybe Leperu just knows that with this horse. I, I don't know. It would be interesting to find that out on Saturday. Well, I mean, he has one race on him, but one is better than none, right? I mean, he, he cut, you know, you, you, he picks up some tendencies from the horse maybe in, in that one race. I will say this. It's not the way to play the game. Uh, you know, Matt, Master Fencer went off 58 to 1 in the Kentucky Derby, and now he's 8 to 1 here. It's still a D, it's still a nice price. You know, I mean, the way to, the thing you want to do is you, you're always trying to get, get him before the cat's out of the bag. But, but 8 to 1 is still a, a respectable price here. And again, I, I, I'm of the belief this is a moderately chalky endeavor. The one we ever talked about in, in I would throw this at you, which would be the irony of all ironies, but it's not like this stuff, you know, hasn't happened before. Uh, you know, when the trainers are always, you know, they, they're pointing horses. But Cassie could beat himself here. Sir Winston uh, was the runner-up in the Peter Pan. And as I said, that that was the, the prep for this race. But this horse, actually, he's got the highest buyer figure in the race. That Peter Pan, he ran a 100 buyer figure, running second, over Belmont. And, have, you know, having a race over the circuit matters, too. His buyer figure in that race is higher than War of Will or Tacitus has ever run. And I, nobody's talking about but it would be Cassie beating himself, you know. And, and it's not like that doesn't happen. Well, I guess the question then about Sir Winston is, is this horse a pace setter or is it a closer? And if it's a closer, you're right. Cassie could end up beating himself. Yeah, no, I mean, his, his best runnings come from off the pace. He's, he, in fact, uh, in nine career races, he's only had the lead once uh, at a race at Woodbine last December. Uh, and he got the lead in the, at the final eighth of a mile. And he's only he's won won two races and they both were at Woodbine. But here's another one. I mean, if we're sitting here saying about the balance factor that we threw out with Everfast, you know, the, the Sir Winston uh, raced at Aqueduct '88, Tampa Bay in '86, Keeneland in the Bluegrass a '65, uh, but the horse was bumped at the start, so a legitimate excuse. But then, out of nowhere, runs a hundred. You know. It's like, well, did he figure something out, or did the horse fire the shot of his lifetime in the Peter Pan, and he's got nothing left today? Well, and, and that's always the question here about these horses in the Belmont. You know, War of Will, as you mentioned, very easy trip along the rail in the Preakness. You know, if there's some more traffic or, you know, now coming from the outside for the first time after being on the inside in both the, the Derby and the Preakness, you know, you sort of wonder here, coming from the outside, taking that longer trip early on in the race, then the distance of this race, I think there are more questions for War of Will as we're kind of talking through this whole field. Well, I think the one thing you're going to see, and just based on the post-position draw, uh, but again, it's such a quirky thing with the distance, but Joeva is really the lone speed in the race, which is usually – a great betting angle. If you're the only one that, if, you know, if there's nothing but speed and there's one closer, play the closer. If there's only one speedster and everybody else is a closer, play the speedster. Um, the only speedster in this race is Joe Eva. But uh, it would have to be a massive leap of faith for this horse to sustain that run. But Joe Eva is going to go to the front. And the one thing that War of Will will get, uh, I would virtually guarantee this, you know, I mean, anything can happen coming out of the gate. But War of Will 
has the speed drawn to his inside. Joeba goes. Gaffleon, I would imagine, you know, to a degree, will hustle him out of the gate a little bit going into that first turn. And War of Will is going to be sitting just off Joeba's flank. So War of Will is going to get first run, right? And out of the, the beginning of the race is the key to me for War of Will. If, if he gets clear out of the gate and he's sitting just off Joeva going into the first turn, you know, then it's is the horse good enough. And then the one we got to watch is Tacitus. And Tacitus is one that will come from off the pace. The question is how far. Uh, and that's the other thing. When you go to a mile and a half, all of a sudden, horses, that they can change their strategy here because they know the pace is going to be different here. So a horse that was up in the first flight that had never been in the first flight before is certainly a viable possibility here. One more horse that we haven't talked about at all, drawing from the four position, is Tax. Aaron Ortiz Jr., you know, he's really come into his own over the last few years here as a jockey. He'll be up in the mount for this one. Finished 14th at the Derby, was never really that much of a factor there uh, at Churchill Downs. To any hope for Tax this week here is currently 15-1. to 1. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and the only reason I say it, um, Tax has raced six times. And he's won two, finished second twice, and third once. Uh, he won the, uh, won the Withers at Aqueduct, then was second to Tacitus by a length and a quarter in the Wood Memorial. Then you go to the Derby, and the horse didn't run a step. But in those six races, the only that's the only race where Tax raced on a wet track. I mean, Tax legitimately may have just not relished the surface at all. And if that was the excuse and Tax comes back and runs a big race, he was only a length and a quarter behind the favorite. Two races back, he was only a length and a quarter behind Tacitus. And... These are three-year-olds, and this is the third race off the shelf, or third race in a form cycle, it would be called. Um, Tax never ran his race because of the wet track. Now he's had five weeks to work. The works are fine. Uh, yeah, I, and actually get the rider change. One of my favorite jockeys is Junior Alvarado. They do make the jockey change here. Um, but there will be those that will say, hey, it's an upgrade. Honestly, I think Tax flies under the radar a bit too, but, I mean – so as much as we're saying it's, it's War of Will and Tacitus, just as you talk through this, in what we've, this exercise we've just done, you can make a legitimate case for a nice price play to saw off the exacta, and if the race collapses, one of them step up and actually win the dog walk. Well, and that's the thing. I'm sure listeners are kind of getting a little bit frustrated because we've literally made a case for just about every one of these horses to either win the race or be part of the board there for the trifecta, you know, maybe wind up placing or showing. So it's a really unique handicap in the sense that we know what we've seen from War of Will. Can he handle this extra distance? We know Tassus may be one of the best speed horses here, but, you know, how does he fare if he gets in traffic? Can he close on War of Will or whoever's, you know, running out front for this thing? And then all of these horses that, have these shots in them that maybe haven't run a triple crown race yet, like Sir Winston or Intrepid Heart, uh, these horses that are off a longer layoff. There's a lot of, of difficulty and complexity, I think, to the handicap of this race. So I don't know. What is, what is your plan of attack here? I mean, are you going to take some of these mid and longer range shots? Are you going to just put them in exotics with the two favorites? What do you think your card looks like on Saturday, Brian? Well, well, what I would say to you, and which I, I don't mean this to be defeatist, that you know we're doing all this work on the Belmont, but I say this all the time. The Derby, the Belmont, Breeders' Cup Day, uh, are, to me, are the toughest races to handicap. I play the horses every day. You know, when you've got a big menu, it's like sports betting. You're not sitting there, but you're, you're, what do we, the, you know, don't bet the game because it's the game that's on TV. You know, uh, sometimes taking a pass is the best thing you could do. The money's probably going to be out there to be made elsewhere. Maybe it's pick threes, pick fours coming into this. That being said, people want uh, an idea of, of what you're looking at here. 
the, the reason we made a case for so many of these is they're running a mile and a half, kid. It's, it's something they'll never do again. You know, I mean, this is such a unique bird. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, all right, so I would say the War of Will, I'm going to take a stand against Tacitus on top. Uh, I think I'd put Tacitus in second and third. Uh, but I, I probably would key War of Will because I think he'll get the trip, guaranteed to get the trip. But I think of the ones we just were talking about, the horses I'd be using underneath are Spinoff, uh, Master Fencer, and I think we just made, I think we made a pretty good case for tax uh, to be part of this. So I'd be playing tries and supers, keying War of Will first and second. So if you did something like, you know, War of Will over Tacitus, Spinoff, Tax, and Master Fencer, and then put them on top and put War of Will second and put them all third, I think is a way to play it. And then you, you hope something stupid happens uh, where a price could get up and win it. But I, I'll take War of Will over Tacitus. All right. I mean, you know, I, I think that, you know, like we said, I mean, War of Will has, has kind of proven it in the spotlight here already. You know, had what appeared to be a pretty good trip going in the Kentucky Derby, obviously had that great, potentially be a pace setter. Then it's just all about endurance at that point. And you have to think that, you know, for, for Mark Cass here, you have to think he expects this horse to be able to go the distance because he very easily could have skipped the Preakness and said, you know what, we can't get the Triple Crown. Let's go ahead and, and save this thing for the Belmont. Instead, he's bringing him back for the third time. So he has to have a lot of trust in this horse, I think, to be able to make that mile and a half. And, you know, again, like you said, a lot of this stuff, you know, the eye test is great. The trainer and jockeys are great if you know their names. A lot of this stuff is reading between the lines and, and understanding what's going through the minds of these trainers and why they're making the decisions that they are. The fact that War of Will's coming back here with no triple crown on the line, I think speaks to the idea that you know, he can handle this distance. Well, and I would say this. To me, the biggest bullet in the chamber here for War of Will is the breeding. Um, the, the first and foremost, the horse is doing well. right? Cassie would not expose him to this unless the horse came out of those two races and fine fettles. But when you look at the breeding, you know, Warfront and Danzig on the top side. And Danzig was a wet track machine. All right, so boom, there's your Kentucky Derby. Okay, love relished the, the wet surface. Um, it was in contention before he, he got hit. Um, but Sadler's Wells on the dam side, uh, a great year, uh, a great uh, turf course that raced at marathon distances. So, you know, getting the distance uh, is is not an issue uh, for this horse. So, it, it, and I think the running style really suits him because, again, Joliva is the only speed in the race. So I think War of Will, will I think we'll know very much so into the first turn. I think Joliva goes, and I think War of Will is sitting a length or two off the flank of Joliva. And then he doesn't have traffic issues. And and then at that point, Gaff Leon, I believe Gaff Leon controls the pace of the race. Now the question is, Gaff Leon at Belmont and at this distance, does he know when to push the button at the right moment? If he picks the right moment, I think Laura wills the horse. All right, so as you mentioned, there you know there's a ton of other racing here this week at Belmont Park and across the country, really. So one thing I do want to ask you about here real quickly the Acorn Stakes. This is the three-year-old Philly race. This is a 3.22 p.m. post time here for this one. And Serengeti Empress is in the field, does draw the first post here, won the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, kind of a surprise the Kentucky Oaks had had a little bit of a uh, medical issue in her previous race, then winds up firing a great shot in the Kentucky Oaks. So she's your favorite. At, well, she's one of your favorites there at 5-2. to two. The horse that's on top right now, Garana, a two-to-one favorite with just a maiden race in her background. So 
What does that tell you when you get a horse that's not really tested in a favorite role here in such a big race? That they really believe this horse is the real McCoy. Um, uh, you know, can it be done? Sure, it's a big leap of faith, but at some point, uh, you, you've got to take that leap of faith. Um, the Serengeti Empress, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, you got the best of all of us in the Kentucky Oaks because she bled through Lasix in the Fairground Oaks. Mark that one down, by the way, that uh, generally now the, the main prep for the Kentucky Oaks is the Fairground Oaks. Um, <laughs> so that's a lesson learned for next year. But, th- again, you know, you're, you're looking at these horses, uh, they, and especially three-year-olds. Some of them could just be flat-out late bloomers. Some of them had injury concerns. Um, and, you know, that they were well meant to be in the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, so there could be, a, again, a myriad of reasons. Um, but three-year-olds can change overnight. There's one other really intriguing development that I want to ask you about here as it pertains to the Acorn Stakes, Cookie Dough. Now, Cookie Dough finished third in the, in the Black Eyed Susan, was expected to do a little bit better than that, winds up finishing third. Not only do we have a jockey change here with Javier Castellano in the irons, we've got a trainer change from Stan Gold to Kieran McLaughlin. Very rare, I think, to see a, a trainer change here in between some of these big races, especially going from the Preakness to the, to the Belmont, essentially. You know, we could see it from the Kentucky Oaks to the Acorn Stakes over that five-week period. But here within three weeks, what does that make you think of Cookie Dough's chances here this week, who is six to one? And what I don't know, and I'm looking at it here, um, you know, one of the main reasons for that is, is conceivably the horse was sold. And if the horse was sold, it was a change of ownership, and the owner, his go-to trainer is Kieran McLaughlin. Um, yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with Javier Castellano. Same owner. Believe you me. Same owner. the same okay. owner. Well, you know, um, He's got eight races, two firsts, the second, and four thirds. And, you know, hey, listen, if you're the owner, you know, trainers change jockeys all the time. If you're an owner and, you know, you, you're just not getting along with the trainer. Uh, you, see, the thing is, I mean, you're, you're either one of these guys that delegates. If you're an owner, you're the trainer. You do what you think's best with the horse, or you're more of a hands-on guy. And you disagree with what you think the trainer's doing, and you you think someone can do it better. It's your investment. There's nothing wrong with that. But one thing, could it be an uptick? Karen McLaughlin's a terrific trainer. He's the go-to guy for Godolphin Racing here in the States. And he's a New York-based trainer, too. So, you know, he knows every blade of dirt at Big Sandy. So that's a plus. I mean, the the one thing I would say, a quick uh, scan through here, uh, the running style here, uh, he, he's going to be going at it, hammer and tong with Serengeti up, Express up top. Serengeti Express is just, uh, you know, she goes. And that has been Cookie Doe's uh, preferred running style. Now, I would say this, looking at it, uh, I can see a, a slight change of strategy here that uh, it might behoove Cookie Doe to, to take back here and try to stage one big run. And sometimes that, that change of a new jockey is the kind of thing that could trigger, trigger that. You see the many races ridden by uh, Jeffrey Sanchez down at Gulfstream Park, and then when you got to uh, Jim Lico, Jose Ortiz was aboard. And the horse ran a big figure, finished third in that race. Uh, I could see Cookie Dough taking back a little bit here and in in staging maybe an improved run. It's an it is an intriguing thought. I mean, it, a lot's gone on in three weeks with this horse. Well, and one of the nice things here about horse racing, you can find a lot of these past races on YouTube or find them wherever you decide to look. The two previous Philly races, you know, that were the appetizers to the main event, the Kentucky Oaks and the Black Eyed Susan, both a mile and an eighth. This one, one mile. So where the Belmont is the longest of the three, the Acorn Stakes is the shortest of the three. So as you're doing your research, as you're studying and handicapping for this race, keep that in mind that this may be more for the speed horse than the horse that has a little bit more endurance. So you want to factor that into the equation as well. 
Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. Brian, how can people check out those two programs? Uh, sportsbookradio.com. You can listen to them live, uh, noon to 2 Pacific time. Uh, KSHP.com. There's a listen live function there. And uh, we have the top sportsbook directors and, and handicappers on Sportsbook Radio. And uh, we love Vegas Hockey Hotline. I mean, if you're a hockey fan, uh, it is Golden Knight centric. I mean, you know, there's a, but it is, it's about the NHL. And obviously, we're diving into the Stanley Cup final. Uh, but it, it really is, if you're a hockey fan, great guests to come on the program on a regular basis. I do it with my buddy Stevie Slapshot. We have some good fun. It's great hockey talk. If you're a hockey fan, I, I really think people would, would, would uh, enjoy it very much. I guess I'll put you on the spot here real quick, Brian. I'm sure you got to go. But best of three now in the Stanley Cup Finals, two off days between all remaining games that are left here. Who do you like the rest of the way? Had the Blues in six, so I'm going to stick with it. The uh, crazy thing with St. Louis is I actually believe they play better on the road than they do at home. Uh, I thought Boston would get a split, and they put all the pressure on St. Louis, and they responded. And now, you know, the, the Zidane Chara broken jaw, you know, he's not what he was but he's still a big component of that defense that plays 18, 20 minutes a game. If he can't go, and now St. Louis has the four, fourth line back intact, and that fourth line for St. Louis is really, really important. It's very similar to what Vegas did last year. And when Vegas lost in the final, they lost because they were staring at themselves in the mirror with Smith Pelly and the Caps' fourth line was a true difference maker in the series. And I think that St. Louis now, even it's a best of three, I think they're going to have an opportunity to wear down the Bruins' defense, and I think ultimately that could be the difference. Make sure you follow Brian on Twitter, at Brian Blessing. Make sure you check out those two shows on KSHP as well. Brian, always a treat, man. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for breaking these races down with me, and we'll talk to you again here uh, next week for the U.S. Open. All right, buddy. I Listen, if you were in town last week, I missed you, but we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Absolutely, bud. Take care, man. All right, bud. Have a good day. There you go. There's Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline, KSHP.com, where you can listen to those two programs. We'll have a new edition of the Betters Box coming up on Thursday, and then we'll chat some UFC here on Friday with Christian Pina. Next week, Betters Box Monday, U.S. Open, probably Wednesday, uh, may try to get some college football stuff on the program next week as well as we kind of take a look at everything that's going on in that market or the NFL. Lots of stuff going on to talk about here on Bang the Book Radio. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.